and on the line with me is Bob Williams. Say hi, Bob. Good, good morning, everyone. We have had some technical difficulties, so you're just going to look at me. I'm sorry, that's all I got right now. But I assure you, this is a very, very handsome gentleman and a very accomplished one. Bob, tell us about your history with Mount Sinai Hospital, please. Okay, so I came prior to working at Mount Sinai. Um, I worked as a respiratory therapist and I was a respiratory therapy department manager for many years. I transitioned over to anesthesia and I was working as an operations manager in um, clinically, you know, managing equipment and technicians and taking care of the physicians um, in Mount Sinai Hospital in there. We, you know, a huge, huge hospital. And after 10 years, I was given the opportunity to move into the um, practice management side. So currently, I'm the administrator for our, we became a health system. And so as we became a health system, we installed our practice into more locations. So I covered two locations on the west side of Manhattan. So Mount Sinai West and Mount Sinai Morningside, which was formerly Mount Sinai St. Luke's Hospital. I just put up a, uh... A screen of the website and in case you don't know as a former New Yorker I was ambiently aware but did not realize how many there were now where was I just a moment ago find a doctor patient maybe I have to go back but there are so many it's branches. A, it's a, it is, it yeah. is growing we um, originally it was Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan and Mount Sinai Hospital in Queens and then we merged um, or took over another health system called Continuum which can, there's um, a downtown Mount Sinai Beth Israel. There's um, former Roosevelt Hospital, which is now called Mount Sinai West. There's New York Eye Infirmary. There's a location in Brooklyn, and we just added a location in Long Island. How many beds does Mount Sinai have in total? Um, you know, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I would say 2,500. I mean, Mount Sinai Hospital has around 1,000. There's uh, 600 beds at Mount Sinai West, maybe 300 beds at Mount, Mount Sinai Morningside. And, you know, Mount Sinai Beth Israel is being was being downsized before the COVID crisis. And so they originally had maybe 600 beds, but they're being transformed into a smaller, say, 60-bed hospital. Oh, they were. I'm sorry, did you say 60? 60, yes. So that's... Um, From 600? It's, it's basically going to be a very small, you know, a small footprint in lower Manhattan. And it, that, that was the planning. You know, a lot of the hospitals in New York have been shrinking in size because of financial issues and stuff like that. And, um, you know, now that this COVID crisis has come along, I don't know if that's going to be reassessed because the big thing right now is having excess um, capacity. Right. Huh. Now, in your role, in your administrative role, tell us what your job encompasses, please. Okay, so normally on a day-to-day -day basis, I um, manage the faculty in our practice, make sure all of their stuff is up to date, interface with the hospital administration to work on different initiatives with them. And, um, you know, right now currently it's more of, um, you know, make sure the billing goes out, make sure we have revenue flowing in, that we maximize our revenue and, um, and they, you know, meet the needs of the practice to make sure that we, um, you know, stay in the black as opposed to moving into the red. And how are we um, doing with that goal this year? Well, we were doing great until um, COVID hit. And then now things are, um, you know, we're, we're starting to recover. So when we had a period of basically, the, you know, 12 weeks where the ORs were basically shut down and, you know, we were redeployed to help take care of COVID patients. And so with no, you know, all of, all of our, fi you know, financial stuff comes from um, performing procedures. And so, you know, it's a combination of our department, you know, our faculty, surgeons, the hospital, you know, and the operating rooms really drive the finances for the entire health system. And so it came to a screeching halt. And so, you know, in the beginning, the money was still trickling in because it comes, you know, there's a lag in getting paid for insurance and stuff. And, you know, now things have kind of like hit, you know, we're at a low point. And basically, um, we're beginning to reopen where I would say we're moving cautiously back. We're about, about maybe 60 or 70% of what our normal volume is. 
but you know it's going to take a while probably like the rest of this year to really catch up and then um you know it's it'll be challenging to see how things are going you know we've been able to do most things now without having to do layoffs and stuff like that i mean actually you know we had more expenses for staffing because of um the, the huge amount of patients that we receive, you know, in rapid succession. So it's um, it's been a big challenge. Financially, you know, prior to my current soon. job, sorry, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was more involved with the um, medical equipment supply side of things. So during the COVID crisis, I was actually pulled back into my old position to help work with other people in the health system about finding PPE locating, you know, ventilators that we are anesthesia machines that we could import from closed surgery centers and stuff like that. And so there was a lot of planning and luckily um we only we didn't have to move beyond the planning part of that. We were able, we would you know we were able to successfully get it all the equipment that we needed. I have a lot of questions. Um you mentioned PPE. How are you doing for that now? Well we have an adequate supply to the best of my knowledge, you know Every every day there are different challenges with which particular item is not available. Like I believe the last thing that I heard was gowns, like impermeable gowns, are the latest shortage thing. So um, so as far as masks and and we have visor things and N95s, we're in pretty much good shape. Um, the demand is much lower. It's it's low. It's a bit lower now. But you know, everyone in the world is wearing masks, and every and anyone who's taking care of patients is wearing N95. So it's um, it's you know, it's a big strain on our resources, and um, and now I think you know we're making sure that we want to have a you know plan for the the unfortunate thing if there's a research in the fall or something. You know, we have to be prepared to um, and stocked up for that to happen. Uh. Having run um, these calls now and uh, the chat room, which you joined today, uh, so if folks have a question for Bob after the call, you can reach him directly on our, our Slack channel. So thank you for that. Um, I've, uh, I've met a lot of people who want, need, and have uh, PPE. So I don't imagine this is part of your uh, roles and responsibilities, but I do have access to um, a great deal of PPE. If, if the, That's very good to know. Sorry? I've actually been inundated with emails from people selling PPE from God knows where. I'm sure. And, you know, what, what the Montana Health System has done was we created a central um, purchasing specifically for PPE because, you know, it has to be, you know, whatever people are trying to sell you has to be vetted to make, especially the masks and the N95s right. to make that, you know, they fit the hospital's needs and they're not industrial and they don't have those exhalation valves. And, um, I'm with you. And well, oh, my, my connection is directly with 3M, so should it? Okay, be that would be, um, I can, I can, if you want to give me the information, I can put, I can share that with our purchasing department. So, uh, okay. the, um, and, you know, they they do things of, of, of huge scale and they were doing central distribution to all of our different facilities. It was a major effort. I'm sure. You know, we also had, you know, people from companies that, you know, we get coffee from for our lounges all of a sudden had PPE and they were charging, you know, $9 a mask for $95, like for N95. Yeah, no. No. It wasn't um, the most up and up situation. No, there's a lot of it. Um, it's a completely other story. So perhaps offline we'll talk about it. But what you're describing, um, is the worst of all worlds. You lost your primary revenue source and you had additional expenses for headcount and taking care of all of these patients. I have to think, as someone who works with medical device manufacturers, this is the wrong time to be in um, medical device capital equipment sales. I, I can't imagine how any hospital can afford anything other than that which is absolutely necessary. Um, I mean, all of, you know, we've had to redo our department's budget for this year and the entire institution is redoing budgets and basically all capital projects are, the brakes have been put on and, um, and really the only thing that the capital that people were buying were ventilators, you know, and so, and then 
you know, ventilators were, and, you know, as as a respiratory therapist, you know, Ford Motor Company is making making ventilators, but you know, is it an? I, there's so many variations. Is it like a home care style ventilator that can do minimum stuff versus a high tech ICU type thing? So it's um, you know, just having a ventilator isn't you you know. It may, it's going to be helpful, but having the right ventilator when you need it, especially for these really sick patients, is a key thing. So, um, and I think right now we have plenty of ventilators, or at least for the time being. And, um, you know, I think that the government is still stockpiling them, or hopefully they are. Um, New York State's been very helpful with us as far you with for resources and um, and there's special programs for you know if someone has to be. We had this shared work program thing where. Um, Staff are being, they're not being laid off, but they're being reduced to say 60% or 80% of full time. And the state is picking up slack for them. So they're being kept whole during this whole period. There's been a lot of confusion about ventilators. First, it was all hands on deck, anyone who could possibly help with this ventilator crisis. And that's frankly, one of the reasons I started these weekly calls to help bring thought leaders and manufacturers and suppliers together to do anything that we could. And it by the, our third week in mid-March, I think, we had the conversation where if you're not already making ventilators and you're not GM, Ford, or Dyson, chances are you're not gonna be able to help. There's just too much by way of regulatory and the like that you're going to be able to produce something that is approved for use. Um, and then, of course, in New York, we had that great big ship dock that had, I think, 20 patients is what I heard on the West Coast anyhow, and that got sent away. Just trying to manage this inflow of patients with no precedent, no timeline has been extraordinarily difficult. Can you tell me what it was like being on the ground in the hospital and to yes. manage so I wasn't I wasn't um, deployed to patient care areas or anything like that but I mean what we were doing in um, our, the anesthesiology department we have a residency program and so we have a simulation lab so we're working with the intensivists and the respiratory therapy department and we were we were you know developing protocols for having to use one ventilator for two patients and so we successfully you know, rigged up our own version of, um, I forget which hospital was the one that came out. I know Columbia came out with a, proto, a simple protocol and we kind of enhanced it so where you could kind of regulate uh, the settings between the different patients by extra valves in the system and stuff. Now, if and, I'm not mistaken, um, with your background in anesthesiology, you personally know how to manage this and understand the science of it. Is that right? Yeah, sure. And it's also as, as, a, as a, you know, trained respiratory therapist. So it's, um, and we were using anesthesia machines as backup and also ventilators, but we were actually able to simulate using two patients on, on one ventilator. And um, we were able to actually do a real-time trial on two patients where it was, they weren't COVID patients, but they were, um, they, you know, agreed to do the trial and it, we, we just did it for a, you know, a two day period and it was successful. So we knew we had that capability should we need it. Luckily, we never had to deploy to that level. So, um, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it's a big challenge to have to, you know, from man, manpower and all the logistics of taking care of the patients. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, with airway stuff you have, and this is a, you know, an aerosolized um, environment. It's like, it's very dangerous for everyone. But um, luckily, we so we learned that we have the capability, but we were lucky enough not to have to, um, to, you know, take advantage of it. That's very interesting what you said. First, let me remind the audience, if you have any questions for Bob, but especially about ventilators or respiratory therapy and the like, uh, this would be a great time to ask it. When you said uh, it was a dangerous environment uh, due to, well, I've already forgotten the big important words that you use. Could you talk about that a little bit more about taking care of two patients at once, what's involved, and how yes. it's incrementally uh, more dangerous for the staff? Right, so that by the nature of, you know, the COVID infection, it's an area, it's a respiratory infection, and it's, um, it's transmitted very easily by aerosolizing, what they call aerosolizing procedures. 
So mm-hmm. that could be if there's a gamut, you know, say if the if a patient needs to go on a ventilator, the first the first aerosolizing exposure would be when the patient gets intubated. So they put a tube, you know, in the patient to connect them to the ventilator or to give anesthesia or something. So we developed um we had you know we developed um, a special airway teams at our institution where we had to, you know, a set of two anesthesiologists or an anesthesiologist and a resident or, an, um, or a nurse anesthetist. So it became a two-person procedure. We had very specific um, PPE protocols for protecting, you know, everyone. And then, you know, putting the tube in, if the patient coughs or whatever, that's an aerosolizing moment, and that's a very risky thing to do. And then any patient you're managing on a ventilator, you know, when you have to move them or there's the, if the tube gets dislodged or if something gets disconnected, mist and stuff goes spewing all over the place. And so, you know, that's why everyone was wearing, you know, two masks, a visor, a gown, double gloves, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and it, you know, it's just very risky. And, um, and we actually had very good um, outcomes as far as employees are concerned because very, very few people um, became positive. So it's a, like, a very positive factor so that the PPE, when used correctly, is actually very effective. Victoria asks, what was and what is now the ratio of cross-contamination? Um, I don't have an answer off the top of my head. I would have to look into it. But um, um, I would say now it's very low because we have very few COVID patients. And we had, we had um, segregated the COVID patients into separate areas. They were cohorted. And we don't have enough of them to do that anymore. So we're just using more classic isolation techniques for the patients. And, um, and I, I, I would have to talk to someone maybe in our infection control to get more information about that. Um, you know, I think that during the crisis, we were there was such a rapid succession of we were bombarded with these patients that it's it's you know from the starting in the ED, they started in the emergency room and then they were they were deployed into the hospital. So, and we you know we we stopped elective surgeries and they pretty much discharged as many non-COVID patient patients as possible. So I would say that the cross contamination was not extensive. I, I can't quantify it any more than that right now. Um, I, in some of our conversations about ventilation, and you're the perfect person to ask, I got the impression that once someone is put on a ventilator, their chances of survival are around 20%. A silly number, I'm very naive about this. Can you educate us about these types sure. of so, statistics. So it basically, it depends on what the underlying condition of the patient is. You know, and I worked many years in the ICU, and unfortunately, a lot of you know, if you're sick and elderly, and you get com- a combination of problems, you know, th- that's probably a 20% survival rate. In the beginning of the COVID business, that's exactly what it was because it was all over the media and the news and stuff. It was a 20%, and um, you know, it's hard. It's hard because you're, you know, a ventilator doesn't cure anything. It just keeps you alive while hopefully some, you know, some other treatments are going on to, to that will hopefully improve your lung function. And um, and it's it was very hard on our, our our clinical staff as well because no one's used to um, psychologically having to deal with that massive amount of patients dying in short periods of time. And um, our, for example, our department. Um, the anesthesiologists and our CRNAs, we turned one of our recovery rooms into a COVID ICU and we completely ran it ourselves. We had, you know, 16 to 20 patients there. And you know, I don't have stats on how many actually survived, but, the, you know, I think it was the 80% who, who didn't make it. So it's, um, it's very difficult. And, you know, as far as in a normal situation, it depends why you're, you know, why you're intubated. If you have a heart problem and it's fixed, then you should be able to come up quickly. If it's surgical patients and they don't have complications, they should come off quickly. It's, um, I would say in my experience, if you don't come off, if you don't recover and get better within like five to eight days, that's a bad sign. And then, that, then you're going to turn into that 80%. I know that you're an administrator now. In the thick of all of this, did you resume your your um, 
clinical role in any capacity? Um, only the only only in simulations and preparations and um, but I was um, I was you know my my administrator and 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 my um, chairman decided that I was it would be better for me to work in the background and um and and you know use my expertise to help prepare for things mm -hmm. and they also tried you know they tried to keep people from um different risk groups you know unfortunately from an age standpoint I fall into one of the risk groups so it's um I think their goal was to kind of avoid people who are over 60 from having to go to deal with patients so much um but you know it's if it's when it's in your blood you're kind of Jumping at the bit to go do something, you know, because you know how to do it. So it's, um, it was a very frustrating situation. I'm going to uh, I'm going to invite my friend Andre, who's always well appointed, sartorially excellent. Although I wouldn't have put that shirt with that tie, um, <laughs> personally. Um, to to add something, he he wrote me privately, and uh, if you would share what you told me uh, to Dr. Williams. Yeah, sure. Uh, doctor, when you spoke about the exposure to aerosol for the intubation process, uh, we are actually working for a client right now that has a patented intubation system that relies on a uh, micro imaging camera to allow for the intubation to be inserted without being directly at the patient. It can be done remotely by, by look, viewing it on a screen. And I'm just curious, I mean, we're in the process of developing it now. It looks very good. It works with a uh, imposable stylet. So it does reduce that exposure to aerosol. And just curious from your perspective, uh, once this comes out, uh, how, how do you feel that this would be received? Well, I think I, we, there's a, already a lot of video laryngoscopes on the market. And um, we actually, part of our protocol for doing these COVID intubations was to use video laryngoscopy. So we're, that was part of our thing. And, um, you know, um, there are, there are a couple of manufacturers, Glidescope, for example, is kind of the industry leader with that. And so our physicians are very fond of that equipment. And, um, you know, there's, an, um, there's a variety of different video systems that are out there. And, um, and so anything, anything that may improve on the quality of the view of what is already available may be of interest, you know. Um, okay. And, and yeah. also, I mean, there's, I've seen a number of other developments, not that we're working on, but they're they're using various shields and things in order to reduce that aerosol at the intubation process, plus some air handlers and so forth. Have you looked at any of those? So, um, so what we did in our in the ICU that we created was normally, um, you know, negative pressure vent like a negative pressure room is the ideal situation for anyone. Hey, who's Bill, can oh, you yeah, stop any right. videos? And. And um, so we actually turned the whole recovery room into a negative pressure room. So, which was, which I didn't even think was possible, but our engineering department was able to pull that off for us. And we also trialed using um, a kind of a loose side head box to cover the patient's head during, right. the, you know, it has kind of holes where you put your your hands in and stuff to get to the patient. And um, it was, we find that to be cumbersome and I believe I would have to look for the source. It was like Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. They, there was an article that came out that that was actually using that was more dangerous for cross contamination for the people who were doing you know, taking care of the patient than than the use for diminishing um, the you know the spread. So so that didn't really work out. But the video the video laryngoscope is is key, and negative pressure is also key. And I don't believe. In our health system, we had any patients who were on ventilators that were in a positive pressure situation. Got it, um, thanks. Bob, what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm gonna bring some other um, attendees on camera today because these poor people don't wanna look at me exclusively the whole time. So Fred, if you have your um, webcam, I've made your mic live and you had something you'd like to contribute. Yeah, I was wondering, um, I think you may have just covered some of it uh, with the uh, uh, survival rate so poor. Um, are they learning over time how to improve this? And then uh, because the survival rate is so poor, I was wondering if there's a bigger demand or are people uh, trying to 
get more ECMO devices because I know those are few and far between. Thank you. I mean, we have had patients on ECMO. We do do ECMO in our institutions. And, you know, that's kind of the last resort. And um, I don't know. I don't, I don't have any statistics on who went on ECMO, who actually survived at this point in time. You know, we did do a lot of patient proning, which means, you know, patients in the ICU normally lying on their back. And then when you have really bad lung function, if you put the patient on their stomach, then it, it opens up different areas of the lung so you can get, like, oxygen into the bloodstream, you know. So the institution created um, what they call proning teams, but it was basically, I think, about five or six people who would be involved with basically flipping the patient from one, like a pancake, from one side to the other, making sure no lines, tubes, blah, 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 and all that stuff comes up. And that proved to be helpful as well. I mean, what you know, we we have a school of medicine and a lot of um a lot of um, science at our institution, and we've actually been able to come up with some treatment protocols that go beyond just mechanical ventilation. You know, um, they were, um, Mansani was very instrumental in studying the antibodies and in and, and plasma and stuff like that, and so we have a program now where like we're taking volunteers who have who are antibody positive and then taking their plasma and using that as part of the treatment. You know, the use of steroids and the use of anticoagulants also because this this COVID disease didn't, initially they thought it, it was behaving more like um, like severe lung disease, like like ARGS where you the, the lungs get really stiff and you can't ventilate. And a lot of the problems were more from like micro clots and stuff in the lungs. So starting like early anticoagulant therapy and then um, then steroids to decrease inflammation along with this plasma and um, and you know the the drug the, the the presidential drug didn't pan out at all and then there's um there's another drug that's, that name escapes me right now so in a combination therapy we've kind of come up with a cocktail to um. And, you know, and the key is starting it as early as possible before the patient gets really, really sick. I'm going to open the mic. Uh, Fred, are you, I know you had a few and questions. You, are you all set that, or did you have another one to add? Uh, I just, no, he mentioned a uh, negative pressure. Is there negative pressure ventilation? Is there any uh, difference in survival rate between negative pressure and positive? I don't think the difference is so the negative pressure is really for the environment in the room. It's not for the like for the for the patient the way the patient's being ventilated. It's really it's really an engineering control, and the purpose of it is to protect the staff that are taking care of the patients. Okay. So the negative, negative pressure, pressure ventilation, ventilation uh, has had people experimented with the negative pressure ventilation that the curious or um, I I don't believe so because that's kind of um, that in in from my going back in time that was that was available well before positive pressure ventilation was and um it's kind of a more crude form of ventilation and in my respiratory therapy career i've only seen it um used with people that have neuromuscular diseases like paralysis and stuff like that so um it's it's you know you don't have as much control over how well you're taking care of the how you're taking care of the patient and the patients just didn't need the ventilation. They needed the positive pressure to open their lungs and plus additional oxygen to keep them alive. Uh, two notes. One, Fred, it seems as though you're sharing your camera, but it's a pure black square. So you may have the whole covered. Uh, and uh, Bob, you may be interested to know that you're helping Kathleen's respiratory system right now because she won't come on camera because she's working out. So we're kind of like the background music. I appreciate that, uh, that you're helping improve the health of the, of the subscribers. I think that's great. Right. That's nice to know. Keith, uh, Kenneth rather, you had a question. You've been very patient. And his question is really at the heart of today's topic, which was, okay, we're getting ready to start reopening the OR. What extra procedures and concerns do we need to address? Kenneth, your question? Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, we know these electives uh, are such an important part of healthcare providers' revenue streams, in particular knee, hip, and spine procedures. Have you discussed any pricing changes with the big manufacturers 
on bringing down the cost of the equipment uh, or anyone you know have, has started those discussions at this point? Um, that's an excellent question and an excellent point. It's not really under my purview. I'm, I'm not involved at all with purchasing implants or screws or all that kind of the surgical stuff. So um, I just, you know, in in New York here, we have buyers groups that we participate in, like the Greater New York Hospital Association and, um, I knew that and I had other problems. groups. Yeah, but I messed it up. For example, that um, where, you know, we participate in the groups to get the best pricing, but, you know, all of this stuff is extremely expensive. And, um, and I don't have an answer to your question because I'm really not involved with procuring any of that kind of equipment. But it's a great, I think it's a great idea. I'm not, um, um, I, I would have to like check with some resources to see if that's going on. Yeah, that's great. I'd love to uh, see Joe tee up a meeting uh, that really focuses on this topic. Thank you. Noted. Bob, could you tell me, I'm interested to know, and Andre, I'll let you go. You are a handsome guy, but they really came for the dog. Right. <laughs> um, I, I'm not familiar. When I think about COVID patients, I think of them being in great distress, and I see the pictures of them on ventilators and the like. Is there such a thing as a COVID operation? I mean, do you take them into the OR to try to take out some of the inflammation or anything like that? Was that a use of the OR? No, the, pretty much the, the use of the OR for COVID patients would be um, for tracheostomies if they've been um, on a ventilator for a long period of time. You know, they put a, um, they take the, they replace the endotracheal tube with a, with a smaller tube in the throat because it's more comfortable for the patient. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was the first thing that we saw with all of the COVID patients. But um, it would be great if, you know, the other thing would be like, the only other thing would be, you know, removing blood clots from someone's leg or something like that and um, those kind of procedures. But it's um, it's unfortunately, at least as far as I know, it's not really. Um, there's no quick surgery. You can't just cut it out and you know get back to normal. Mm -hmm. So, so unless something comes along, I mean, you know, um, something concurrent then, for right. a pre-existing so, condition. It wasn't like I was fine. I got COVID, and there was an operation for it. Um, I think if that were, we could discover that, that would be great. But it's, um, you know, it's more of a medical illness than a surgical illness. And it's, um, and, you know, the good thing is most people actually, you know, um, recover from it. It's just the, the people who develop the severe symptoms and go into the ICU are the ones who um, have the most, you know, the worst outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, Mauro who... Uh brought us together today, so I'm going to make him a panelist, because Mauro, you had some questions as well. So let me let the audience see how handsome you are. We guapo. Oh, thank you. Hola. Hi, oh, hello, hello. Hey, Bob, how are you? Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. I really appreciate it. Well, we really appreciate it. The whole, the whole group appreciated it. I'm happy to participate. You know, Mauro and I have known each other for a very long time, so he didn't tell me the story. What's the backstory there? Oh, I met Mauro when he was working in um, um, cerebral oximetry for a company called Casmed, uh, and um, my institution was Edwards Lab Science. Yeah, it's um, it's that's Edward. I think Edwards owns it now, right? It's um, correct. And so you know, um, our physicians, especially for cardiac surgery, were big proponents of using their technology to monitor their patients. Goal of the therapy, the goal of the monitoring was to to um, make sure that patients who had cardiac surgery didn't have strokes, basically. And um, so, Mara, you know, was the, the, the company supported a lot of our educational activities and the conferences that we had and stuff like that. And um, so, Mara, we wasn't really in the sales. Uh, we were in marketing more, right? It's, um, that is correct. And. Um, so we developed a friendship. We saw each other at meetings, you know, and it's like we've been in touch this whole time. So he's a great guy. Thank you, Bob. Likewise. Yes, no, and I appreciate it. And, and, and my question goes to you about that, because now that you're trying to go back to normal, right? And I remember Mount Sinai, they were days. They had 
six, seven ORs running at the same time. I mean, it, it was just basically cardiac surgery was the bread and butter, to sort of wow. speak. And in how do you go back and what can a patient expect going into procedures like that and elective procedures? And also what happened to those patients that they already have a COVID-19, right? And they're coming off the, uh, the, the, the virus and they need that operation. So I don't know how-, I mean, how, how Okay, so uh, so let me let me talk first about patients who had COVID and recovered and have to come back for a non-related type thing. So we, the whole institution has a protocol and a screening process that anyone who's coming for surgery that's unless it's you know life or death emergency situation has to have a COVID um, nose swab test to within 48 to like three or like within like two the the time frame keeps is a moving target. But, you know, within the two or three days before the procedure. And so if you're not negative, then they'll, they'll postpone the procedure. You know, and then a lot of patients who were, had COVID and had the, the, the nose swab thing was positive, there's remnant virus particles that stay in the nose. So after you've been, been treated and recovered, you could still get kind of a false positive because it's shedded virus that doesn't really, it's no longer infectious. So, so we have protocols for safety. You know, we're we're ramped up back back to full the capabilities for full schedules now. But so we have intense screening in place. And then the institution, as far you know, we have we've taken a lot of precautions. You know, to keep the general public safe as well. For you know, patients who come to visit us for, in our offices for outpatient, they have temperature screening at you know at at the entrances to the hospital. You know, they have to put on a, like a hospital grade mask when they come in, um, to do hand sanitizing. We, we only allow some like four or five people in an elevator so we can't have a cattle car elevator and stuff like that anymore. So they've really thought the whole process out. You know, they've, they've separated waiting rooms. So only some, you know, people have social distancing within the waiting room and stuff like that. So it's, um, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's only been really happening for the last, like, say, week or so. So it's we're new to it, but um, but you know, the patients seem to like it. I mean, the biggest drawback for patients coming in now is that their you know family members can't they can't visit them yet, mm -hmm. unless it's someone you know like someone's having a baby or someone's dying, basically. So um, so those are you know that that's one of the negative things about it. But the rest is like you know, we're just taking tons of precautions. And I have to say that it amazes me how adaptable everyone is, you know, to go from living in a free society to all of a sudden staying home for two months or three months. And then, you know, in New York City, we're living with boarded up buildings, you know, from non-COVID related issues. And, um, you know, we just adapt and keep moving. So it's, um, so I think as long as, you know, depending on what happens with, um, you know, a second round or increased infections, we, you know, it's kind of, it's a work in progress. Thank you, um, Bob. And and I and I really want to thank you and all. I mean, all your colleagues. I know I know I know a lot of people there at Mount Sinai and other places in New York. And it just you have done a really great job, amazing job. I mean, you know, I have a, a really soft spot for all of you guys. I love you all, guys. <laughs> thank you. We also had strong leadership from our governor, so that was very helpful too. That, that is true. We have a, a few more. Uh, questions for you, Bob, but I, I really, um, I want to focus on the, the title of today's talk, how to resume elective procedures after COVID-19, and you addressed a lot of that just now, but I'm wondering, given your role in administration, I know you didn't prepare anything formal, but is there like a, well, first you have to, then you have to, then you have to, is there a, a small checklist you can kind of give us an idea, and keeping in mind that a lot of our members are manufacturers, um, who want to start re-engaging the way they used to uh, with your yeah. operation, how do they begin to do that? Uh, as I understand it, no one's allowed in. There are no more, you know, sales calls. There are no more standing in the OR and helping people understand how the new technology works. Um, how do we resume? You know, that's a very good question. That's something I haven't even thought about. I mean, for, for us, stepwise, the first thing was, going on, you know, what the, what the state, the governor decides that we can do. 
And then our focus has been on, you know, safety for the staff, safety for the patients, and then safety for the visitors to come into the hospital. Can I interrupt for a second? You just mentioned something. I want to make sure I understand. Um, in a lot of parts of the country, I know my state of Washington, we have this phase one, phase two, these phases of what you can and can't do. There's nothing like that in the hospital system, is there? There's no, we're not at a phase where we can do a, a liposuction, for example, or something that would be completely elective. That's, you know, you don't need that rhinoplasty. I'm sorry, it's not happening. I mean, we were guided by the New York state phases. So like the governor of New York would kind of dictate when we could go back to full, like we only went back to full elective surgeries last week. And mm -hmm. so we're, even though we're in quote unquote phase two of reopening as a state, but, uh, you know, the governor has decided who, what you can do and when. So, you know, first it was just emergent stuff. And then, you know, more cancer type surgeries that were semi-elective. And then, you know, he, he opened the hospitals first. And then after that, we're like surgery centers and doctor's offices that perform procedures were able to open as well. So right now we're full, basically full open, you know. And as far as, you know, sales reps calling, I mean, that's part of our daily life here that we're used to and interact with them, you know. And um, I know in orthopedics and in cardiac cath and stuff, a lot of them participate in the on a regular basis in the cases. Um, so I don't know if that's been addressed yet. Right now, everyone's focused on minimizing, ex, you know, I don't want to say the word excess people because you're not excess people, but, you know, more you know, the amount of people that are actually in the institution. So, and you can't um, really do that by Zoom. You know, all of our meetings have moved to Zoom. We're in a Zoom world now. So um, I would, I don't know what's going to happen there. It's, um, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great question and a great, and it's something to think about. But um, you know, in well, anesthesia, have, in your role as administrator, would you have some suggestions about how you'd like to see it happen at your institution? Well, I think I think we should. I think it should, you know, when it resumes or when we're given the green light to do it, you just have to follow the safety precautions, you know, and um, I mean, we already have a lot of regulations about, you know, sales reps have to wear like a red cap when they're in the OR to be easily identified and stuff like that. And, you know, we already have, Monsanto already have protocols where, you know, a sales rep has to go through security. They can't sneak in the back door and go to the doctor's office kind of thing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. um, so I would just say, you know, safety first. And, um, you know, we need each other. And, you know, um, and that's definitely something that needs to be worked on. Okay. Uh, John Hannigan notes that he had a doctor's visit yesterday or, or a hospital visit or clinic. And he was asked to wait in his car until it was his turn. So that was his social distancing uh, experience. Uh, Ken, you had a second question. Let me reopen your mic. Oh, it's open. Go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, along these same lines, it sounds like when access is opened, uh, you know, at the bare minimum, uh, medical device reps are going to need to be tested, I would assume. Uh, before they're allowed into the OR, uh, if if that turns out to be the way it, ha it continues on, do we know what the average cost at this point is for a single swab test that would be sufficient to allow access into the OR? Um, unfortunately, I don't know that that information. But you know what we can what they're doing, like for say if someone's coming into the institution. Um, you know, you can have like symptom assessment as well, where, you know, they'll take your temperature before you come in. And then, um, you know, right now for everyone who's been getting the swabbing has been free so far. So, I mean, I know there's a cost that's associated with it, but, um, you know, it's, it's just being done. And um, I, I don't really know how much it costs, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. Kathleen has to jump off, but let's see if I can get her just before she runs. Kathleen, you got a sec? I just opened your mic. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, as you know, I had a question about masks and masks in the general public. There's so much um, contradicting information, contradictory information out there. And um, 
I'd really like to hear from this group what their perspective is on what is the best mask for the general public and how the hell can we get people to wear them? <laughs> I don't know that you can address that one, but perhaps the first. Bob, as a respiratory expert, you definitely know the difference among the different kinds of masks. Well, it's so, you know, the, the N95 mask is a, is a very high level filtration mask, and that's really only for use by healthcare workers. Then, okay. Um, a paper, any kind of paper face mask for the general public when you're in the street. And like, for example, when we're in the hospital, if I leave my office, I put a paper mask on. And, you know, the, the purpose of the mask is really to protect other people from being infected by you. So it's keeping your, if you, if I had COVID, I wouldn't be, you know, expelling it into the air so everybody could breathe. Um, masks that are not that are not safe are the ones that have those valves on the front or it has like a little plastic piece on the front or those masks that are used for industry when you're dealing with chemicals with those um, canisters on the side because you can when you inhale the valve is closed but when you exhale your exhale breath goes through the valve into the room so those are not they may be safe for you but they are not safe for other people who are close to you Right, and I'm wondering how do we make that information more publicly available? Because out and about, I do see people with the respirator masks on, and that's not helping um, me. <laughs> that's, I mean, within our institution, I mean, we have, you know, blast emails and and notifications and things going out all the time with pictures of the masks that um, are that are should be used and the ones that are outlawed in the hospital. And you would, I would think that, you know, local governments and the media would, would jump on this as, um, as something to talk about and, and, and as an educational thing. Even, you know, New York City has all these ads on TV about, um, they, you know, wear a mask, but they don't take it to any deeper level than that, you know. And a lot of, I see a lot of the masks with the valves. And then, you know, you have people with bandanas covering their face, and that's, um, you know, if you're outdoors and you're six feet away from someone, it's probably okay to do that. But, you know, a cloth mask or a scarf or something like that, you know, in a healthcare environment is just not safe enough. Right. Uh, Victoria, thank you, Kathleen. Thanks for sticking around. Victoria, I have opened your, your mic. Hello. Yep, you're on, Victoria. Oh. Okay, you wanted me to ask my question? If you'd like. Okay. Or I can Sorry. read it. Okay. Um, so the question that I had, which I think um, he had already touched on, was is there sterilization and or sanitation process and procedures that are nationally or globally in place for hospitals when people come in for those elective surgeries that aren't necessarily COVID patients? So, so what we've done in our institution, I don't, I mean, there are standards for for cleaning and stuff, but you know, every instant, every institution follows state regulations for that kind of stuff, and we have our own protocols in place for um, you know, the general term we use is terminal cleaning, and um, especially for the COVID, we we set up special processes for decontaminating COVID patients' equipment and stuff like that. And for example. When our, we closed our COVID ICU, the, the space was closed for a week. We followed manufacturers' um, recommendations to take all the equipment apart, wash it, sterilize it, and put it back together, and then let it sit long enough so if there was any chance of any remnant, you know, pathogen on it. Um, um, you can't, you know, you're not going to cause someone to be infected by that. And what we're doing now in operating room, we have, each look like our different locations have a, um, a a dedicated COVID OR, so we're only putting COVID patients in that, you know, and so, and then that that will be cleaned at a higher level than a regular OR, you know, that, that you know it's a successive level of cleaning over um, what we normally do. Bob, we're hearing a lot about whether this is uh, the first wave continued or a second wave of COVID. Uh, we're seeing the news every day uh, about how infections are on the rise. Uh, what's the chances of the elective surgeries that you've resumed coming off the table again? Well, I think that, you know, 
if if we see spikes in in cases again, we would um, we would cut back. You know, I know that other New York State right now is in a great position because we're actually we're still on a downward, you know, a, a very good downward trend. But then if you look at the approach that different states have taken, that um, you know they didn't maintain social distancing for as long. They were in a rush to reopen. You know, they were having beach parties or whatever. Um, and now their cases are ticking back up. And, um, you know, that's, to me, that's, this is, they're still riding the first wave, which is maybe not as high of a wave as it was in the beginning, you know. And then, and, you, you know, the, I think that what, what the Northeast has done is, is the best practice model as far as containing all of this, you know. And then it's unfortunate that, I guess as a country, we can't come together and all work on one thing, you know, and, and have a consensus to do everything the same way. So um, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, and if, you know, say someone from Florida comes to New York, you know, they're going to have to, you know, be quarantined for two weeks when they get here kind of thing. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a, the reality is very scary because we just really don't know. And then, you know, there's like the smoldering current infections versus the um, a second wave when flu season hits in the fall, you know. I mean, we're already preparing for, um, you know, for a second wave. I just, I was on, actually on a meeting with our emergency department earlier today about learning from what we did from this, the, the, the first wave, and how we could improve on the second wave. So it's, um, and what were the main to be takeaways? Sorry? What were the main takeaways? Um, Retraining staff to perform different functions, making, say, for example, a floor nurse feel comfortable taking care of a patient in an ICU type setting where you don't have all that experience. Um, just general planning, when to put up a tent outside the hospital, you know, so to, to add, add capacity, stuff like that. Okay. Well, we're almost at an hour, and I'm really grateful. I know how busy you are. Any closing thoughts for the group? Um, just, you know, stay safe, wear a mask. Um, don't touch your face. Yeah, don't touch your face. Um, I'm doing this the whole time, but go on. I know. I've uh, Well, you can't see me, so it's fine. Now, for this for this meeting, anyway, I'll make that, I'll fix that in the future. And then for all your people in industry, I would say, um, you know, work with the institutions that you deal with. Try to, um, you know, reestablish, like, one-on-one -on -one relationships. That's Bob Williams. He's with Mount Sinai, and he is on Slack, so you can reach him directly. Bob, very grateful. Thanks for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. See you next week.